Hello, Pod Smashers of the Internet, and welcome to another episode of Eight a Bit Pod Smash, where gaming goes to grab a beer. We are your hosts, Penguin and Termite. I am Termite. <laughs> I'm Penguin. And we're giggling because I spilled a little beer when yeah. I tinked. We're a weekly video game podcast, smashing together ideas you care about with the general conversations of video games. And tonight we are introducing another entry into our series of developer profiles. Yes, and we're going to be looking at doing a deep dive into Obsidian Entertainment, who are... The makers of such popular games as Fallout New Vegas, and most recently Outer Worlds, and a bunch of others we're going to be talking about. Yep. So, we're... I'm really glad we decided to do this one, because when I researched it, I was surprised. There's a lot of surprises. They're relatively new compared to the gaming uh, industry. Yeah, and Mm -hmm. they made a lot of games I... Like, I I looked at the list and I was like, oh, oh, oh! You learned so much. I learned so much. learned so so much. Cool. Uh, We, tonight, are drinking a lot of... Like, yes, we're gonna we're, have to have a whole beer section right now, yep. so go for it. We are where gaming goes to grab a beer, and because of our gracious, amazing friend Sean of the show, he has contributed three beers. Not one, not two, but three different three beers. Three beers for this episode. And because we have other beers planned for future episodes, we're doing them all tonight. We're, we're gonna doing talk them all. Them all. It's talk great. about them all. I so, know. I thought we kicked around the idea of drawing them out, but Nah, we decided we're just going to go off. Yeah, we got plenty coming. So it's really good. It is really good. It's like, it's exciting because it's the, like, usually we're like, or there are some weeks where we're like, so we're having this beer again. (laughs) Right, because it's light. (laughs) Or we're just, uh, yeah, or we're just, or we have some crappy beer that we just kind of picked up. So it's nice that we actually have a selection of very nice beers. It's right. very feels like a treat. And I have some on the horizon. So, like, we're going to have good beers coming in the next couple of weeks, too. So we don't have a reason to need. Ice House. Yes. <laughs> Which I saw in there. Yep, it was pretty bunch. funny. Yeah. yeah, that's why I said that. So um, we're starting with first of three is from the brewery Mustang Sally up in Chantilly, Virginia. This is called Forbidden Freak. It is a sour, and its tasting notes are black currant, cinnamon, and milk sugar. I'm not getting the cinnamon. I'm definitely getting the black currant, though. And I, yeah, taste wise, black currant. Feel yes. in your mouth is completely milk sugar. Oh, okay. Like yeah. it's got that full bodied, creamy to it yeah. which i it's think definitely creamy yeah it definitely feels very smooth although you said you don't taste the bubbles or feel the bubbles i definitely feel bubbles i don't feel bubbles i feel bubbles a little bit yeah. to you, there you go. <laughs> it actually reminds me of a, a holiday like tradition in my family we do we do like a new year's no not new year's a christmas eve party host a christmas eve party and they always get my sisters always get sparkling grape juice and for whatever reason, this makes me think of that. And maybe really? not exactly a little bit more sour, obviously boozier, but I'm definitely getting like, I'm like, ooh, feels like a holiday toast. <laughs> this is only a 5%, so it's a good beer mm. to get started with. You know what? I'm getting cinnamon after notes. Uh-oh. That's there it good. is. good. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like, I'm just like like doing swallowing motions with my mouth without any beer in, in my mouth. Other than the... Yeah, there the, it is. Yeah, the it's light. on the back end. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's awesome. Ugh, That's cool. What a complicated beer. I like it. So are we just going to stop and introduce new beers as we go, or are we going to introduce them all now? Do we want to introduce them now, but then... Let's do it with each segment. So let's make it a point to finish our okay. beers before we move on to the next segment. Sounds good. And then start another beer with each segment. So we start off the show by talking about news and goings on in the gaming industry or in our lives. And so that's what we'll start with. So is there anything you wanted to talk about first? Mm-hmm. Today is a very special day. It is. I figured you were going to talk about Today that. Today is Tuesday, December 3rd. This is the day we're recording this. It will go live a week from Monday, so I don't know what day it will go, but uh, off the top of my head, I don't have a clue. But today is the birthday of PlayStation. Yay! Happy birthday! How old is PlayStation? 25 years. 25 years. Does that make you feel old? It makes me feel old. Really? A little bit. I guess the PlayStation wants to come out when I was five then because i'm 30 yeah there you go (laughs) wow it's interesting because i remember the legend of zelda 25th anniversary which was like years ago yeah yeah yeah. and i feel old because that was 2011 when zelda came out and it was its 25th anniversary so now it's playstation yeah and you're like oh from the nes zelda game which is you know pixel 8-bit uh-huh to now you have the 32-bit era of being playstation is now it's 25 years, so I've now lived both 25-year anniversaries. That makes me feel old more than anything else. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, so today is the birth of that new console, and it started with a contract signed between Nintendo and Sony to develop a CD-ROM add-on to the Super Nintendo. And then Nintendo found a better deal through Philips, and how did they address, how did they communicate that? 
They announced it at a trade show. They're like, and Philips is going to help us make a new yeah. add-on. Sony was so Not your best miffed. look, Nintendo. And Sony was a great you know, computer, electronics, you know, sound systems, TVs. Also fellow Japanese company. Right. Yeah. Uh, and Japanese culture, very honor-based, very true to themselves, character and integrity. Actually, like, it is rumored that the reason the PlayStation even existed, because Sony never ventured into the gaming industry yeah. at all at this point, was just to go after Nintendo. Just to stick it in Nintendo. And- yep. In a lot of for a lot of intensive purposes, they did. <laughs> and now, so fast forward to now, where the numbers had just come out from some sales recently, records sales records. The top five home consoles. These are consoles that hook up to a TV, yeah. so not handhelds. Of the top five consoles sold in the world ever in life, four of them are Playstations. Yeah, and the Wii is the one that's like second place. <laughs> so it's PlayStation Two, Wii. So take that Nintendo, PlayStation that, Four, that Nintendo. PlayStation Three, and PlayStation One. I, think it's the order i don't know i just i wonder what you know sometimes i like to think about if there are multiple universes out there and in one of those universes it happened that you know or one or several of those universes it happened that playstation and nintendo's deal went through yeah what does that world look like i I, arguably i wonder if they'd have as good a games because there's a lot to say about the fact that like nintendo were very stickler about the about quality quality and and and, but you know also they've come to be very family friendly i wonder how much like target audience content that would have been for higher older kids would have gotten not approved on nintendo that Mm -hmm. was open open open-ended on playstation and um yeah i just wonder if we would have gotten the kinds of games that we got or if maybe you know video games would have an even harder time being recognized as something that's not for kids. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Nintendo 64 had its share of some mature stuff, like yeah. Congress Bad Fur Day, Mortal Kombat 4, some fighting games and stuff. But PlayStation had Metal Gear Solid, yeah. Tomb Raider. Like, those were adult Tekken yeah. what, and, like, very mature Jet Moto and Cool Borders. Like, there weren't the cartoony, like, 3D platformers that Rare was making, yeah. you know, on PlayStation. So, yeah, there's that's the – so cheers to the legacy cheers. of PlayStation – that's and a better tank was, than the one well, we had earlier. Glasses are much more empty now. <laughs> That's true. Yep. And were there other bits of news we wanted to talk there about? There was one thing I want to talk about. I do want to talk about. Speaking of Nintendo? Speaking of Nintendo, yes. Yeah, shift gears and Burr. instead of bashing Nintendo, give them some props because we can't ever bash Nintendo for very yeah, long. Nintendo's amazing. <laughs> the It just came out in numbers that the one of the best selling items electronics period during black friday was the nintendo switch and they moved what 9.5 or we don't know the the exact numbers because retailers haven't reported it necessarily yet but preliminary reports appear to be about 9.5 million units it's crazy just this past weekend sold so between black friday and cyber monday and that's just the beginning of the holiday purchasing season yeah so uh experts analysts are expecting that within three years it'll hit the hundred million the Switch will hit the 100 million units that's sold. That's crazy. Yeah, that's nuts. And specifically considering that, like, it'll be, you know, they may have some competition with the PS5 and the Xbox Scarlet, but, like, I actually think that that's not going to be competition at all because fewer people are going to be buying those. Only a few hardcore people are going to be buying those consoles when they come out next holiday. So I think even more people will be like, I'm going to get the Switch now, and the next year I'll get the PS5 or whatever. Mm. So I think that they may even have a chance of selling even more units. That would be crazy. Next year. The Nintendo Wii, if you remember, its craze sold 101.63 million. Wow. So yeah. if they can outsell the Wii, it's pacing I to do so. Outsell. Yeah, I think it's pacing it's to pace. do so. Yep. The most interesting thing about what you just said is Nintendo is the only company that did not discount the Switch yes, at all. Yes, that's what we were even noting. They were like, it sold as much as it did without cutting, without gouging the price. None. So Nintendo kept the price right at two ninety nine ninety nine, uh-huh. and the retailers were the ones that were trying to figure out how they can sell these things, <laughs> yeah. and so they were bundling it, taking the hit. So Best Buy, Walmart, Target, Amazon, they were the ones taking the hits by bundling memory cards and screen protectors and cases and all these other things. Nintendo only had one bundle, and that came with Mario Kart 8, and that was very limited. So that was... And they and they yep. won they won Black Friday. Yep. <laughs> you like, get, and not just not just gaming, like not just in the gaming world too. They it seems like they won Black Friday. Period. Period. Like <laughs> headphones, TVs, yep. like everything. Yeah, the Switch was one of the was the hot item of the season. And you can get a PlayStation Four Slim with God of War, Horizon Zero Dawn, and The Last of Us Remastered for two hundred dollars, yeah. one ninety nine. Yeah. 
and it outsold that for a hundred dollars <laughs> more in one game. Like that's how nuts. popular the Switch is. So it's nuts, yeah. it's it's insane. Yeah. So Nintendo is killing it. Yeah. Right so now. congratulations, Nintendo. But that's and the only other piece of news I had. So I don't know if you Sony actually didn't even chart. So Xbox, uh, there's another article that was released from Game oh, Magazine yeah, 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 I saw that. Mm-hmm. that showed the Xbox One topped the charts in the UK for Black Friday shopping weekend, mm-hmm. and that's. Kudos to Microsoft because yeah, you know they've made a lot mm-hmm. of changes over the last. We talked at length on this podcast about what Microsoft has done to kind of, you know, show favor or be consumer friendly, and it's showing now because they're, yeah. they're they're gaining. They're gaining and traction. They still won't release how many numbers, how many consoles they've sold in the Xbox One. Microsoft family, yeah. yeah. There's like a lot of speculation out there based on mm-hmm. like how many people are playing Call of Duty and release weekend. Yeah, they, they can see yeah, who's yeah. playing from which console, and they can kind of get a picture for how percentage of what Xbox is versus everybody else. Anyway, yeah. Speaking were, of Call of Duty, they won apparently. Yeah. Software. Yeah. They did. Sales. I'm not surprised. I'm so angry though. Every Stop year. supporting Activision. Every year. <laughs> Come on, people. <laughs> yeah. Please. Every year. It's Call of Duty. I know, and I understand that. I understand part of its tradition, but it's also, I guess, tradition. But it's just, it's, it's not. Just it just how shows that the Activision masses, is. the people who are listening to us and listen to video game podcasts and read video game articles that care about Hong yeah. Kong or like, you know, the, those type of protests or the politics of the gaming industry are so little. It is. It's so it's small. It's such a tiny such a little small island. minority. Yeah. Which is like, how do we then reach the masses how do we educate them because this kind of stuff can you know what i mean like or maybe it can't i don't know maybe i'm a cynic and i go mm-hmm. you know dis- the fact Here that we Disney's are talking still alive, microphones, right? yep, crazy all right whatever so anyway, you don't have to get too far now <laughs> yeah, right so all that to say was sony didn't win anything over black yeah. friday weekend mm-hmm. despite their amazing bundle mm-hmm. which everyone on this podcast go get a playstation 4 if you haven't <laughs> it's the best deal you'll ever get yeah the two of the best games this entire I don't think generation they can now it's too late it'll come back yeah that's true yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. yep all right. Uh, well, that's does it. For, does that do it for news? Is it? You ready to crack open another beer? We will do the next beer. All right, so, we're gonna do the next beer before so we from, start the next section segment from the same brewery. From the same brewery, which Different was style. Mustang Sally. Mustang, <laughs> let's say flocking Molly. <laughs> what? <laughs> All right. Which we're okay. Dirty glass. We got. We have to keep glasses separate here because during our beer pairing episode, we shattered one. Oh yeah. On the podcast, we did that. Yeah, so it was fun. Mr. Kevin Benedict was here. Open for that. that closer to the mic. There you go. Yeah. Get that click in there. Get the click. Get the click. So this is called Laden Swallow. It is an imperial stout at 7%. As I pour mm. the beer, I can't read the can, so I will talk about it. If you can read the can side, what its tasting notes are, it's extremely can't. sweet. And Sean specifically said Penguin would like this I beer. I hope so. I mean, it looks exactly a little Based. right in my alley. It looks like it pours out of that glass like crude oil, so I it's imagine thick. it's going to be <laughs> something I love. Thick. And uh, with two C's. Kudos thick. to Sean for actually paying attention to Penguin yes, Man's again, taste. Thank and you, Sean. Making I, a purchase. Based I feel on very that. pampered. I feel very, very spoiled. Me right too. Now. And it's this is nice. our podcast. He, yeah. These are his holiday gifts to us. That's very so. sweet. Thank you. We didn't. We, and he again. Speaking of generosity, and you know, we're gonna have a whole podcast on generosity and people who do this kind of thing, asking for nothing in return, just so that we can have joy and we can share that joy. Those are the best kind of people in the world. So yes, thank are. you, Sean. You're one of the best kind of people in the you world. You move the world <laughs> forward. Uh, I lied. This is a 10.9%. <laughs> yeah, I, was, I didn't even pay attention to what your percentages were. Yep. But yes, it's a strong uh, so, one. So, toasted coconut hazelnut imperial stout. So, oh, I can smell it. It yeah. smells like nuts. It does. It's very nutty. So it almost smells like coffee. Mm, it definitely tastes like coffee. I he you see, it's funny. He doesn't know this. I drink I, like one of my favorite kinds of like... Mm flavors to go with coffee is either hazelnut coffee uh-huh. or like hazelnut creamer and coffee yeah love hazelnut with coffee and this tastes just it like does. hazelnut coffee the toasted coconut hazelnut yep. so there you mm, go definitely, definitely get the toasted coconut as well Ooh, so yeah this absolutely. is great it's kind of smoky i mean yeah to- that's i guess that's, that's a ho- toasted mm. i definitely get a little bit smoky but that body is so thick two c's two th- c's on that thick two c's thick Ooh, now i know how they call it a fatty that's justin uh. timberlake all right so drinking this what was it called again the actual name of the beer we made a lot of jokes about this uh we're gonna keep this podcast family friendly oh laden Laden swallow Swallow because a bird is (laughs) called the bird bird. because of the bird no because of the uh because of the is monty python joke is it yeah are you serious coconuts the coconuts uh what is the airspeed velocity of an unladen swallow (laughs) are you serious (laughs) that i completely this would be a laden swallow because it's carrying a coconut that's awesome i love this beer even more now (laughs) that's amazing 
All right, well, that leads us into our next segment, which is... Doing, doing this podcast, podcast is our favorite, favorite thing. thing. Doing, doing this podcast, podcast is our favorite thing. I love it when you actually get it right. This time I did. <laughs> you did. I looked. Yeah, oh, nice. Yeah, it's in front of us. <laughs> All right, what's your favorite thing? This sweater that I'm wearing yes. is my favorite thing. Uh, I was I mean, originally... These beers are our favorite things, yeah, to be I was real, gonna, but, but yeah. we're talking so much about the beers exactly. throughout the whole episode yeah, yeah, yeah. that it's kind of implied. Fair enough, yep. Uh, but Sean... And his contribution is actually my favorite thing. Yes, yes, but because, mine too. Yeah. But yes, we'll uh, also do an additional favorite thing. Go yes, for it. Exactly. So this Christmas sweater that I'm wearing is a Sony PlayStation. Yeah, it's got Christmas the Christmas sweater. It's dark blue, like the box on the PlayStation Two. Yep. If you remember the PS2 box, it's right there. You can look mm-hmm. at it. It's dark blue. It's awesome. <laughs> Crane my neck. Crane your neck to see that. It has the sacred symbols on it, mm-hmm. and that is the circle, cross, square, and triangle. In the front with some reindeer and snowflakes and dark blue and Penguin Man is freaking out. It looks exactly because... like a Christmas sweater, like a yeah. tacky, cheesy Christmas yeah, sweater, exactly but with the, with the symbols on it. And it's there awesome. is a post on social media. I posted a selfie of me and my son when I came when it oh, came yeah, in. Nice. And the reason why this is my favorite thing this isn't just because of how cool it looks and how warm it is. It's because they don't make it anymore. It's from a vendor called Numskull, which okay. makes gaming gear, and you can go there nice. right now and like see their list of merchandise, and they have a whole bunch of sweaters and like cool stuff. But this model, this exact sweater, I bought off eBay from Europe, <laughs> and, Europe. And, like, and I like took a chance because the seller was like not high rated, and I'm like uh-huh. ah, but it was also fifteen dollars cheaper than it would have been if it was new. So nice. and it was new, like uh-huh. like yeah. So uh, anyway, it's a couple years old, still new to me, new in packaging, brand new sealed sweater that see, you I guys assumed will all see. it was a uh, when i first saw it on social media i assumed it was a like you had already had your your small groups tacky sweater party. no we haven't had that yet oh, so you can yeah. wear it to that absolutely right, yeah nice. this is it like you're not this gonna win good... any contest with no, it but it's still i'm not trying to win yeah this is just me this is my this is i love this it's so my favorite thing nice. i love this i actually wore it to the event that sean brought these i mean beers i'm convinced me, you so. i'm not convinced you haven't taken it off yet at this point so you want me to take it off <laughs> This is not that kind of podcast. Oh, right. right. Yeah. Uh, All right. My favorite thing is I just went to a wedding this weekend for my friend Aaron. I think I've already shouted out to him, but I'll shout him out again. Aaron Napotnik, congratulations on the nuptials and getting married. (laughs) Nuptials and vittles. I wanted nuptials and vittles. I had a blast. Everything about it was fun. What is a vittle? Vittle is like food. Okay. Like snacks. Snack food. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I like it. It's one of my favorite words, vittles. But. Everything about it, the you know the the I was a groomsman, so like the the groomsman attire was swanky. He got us as groomsman gifts. He got us tie bars with our initials engraved in them, Ooh, and then in shenzi. addition to that, he got a ram's horn drinking mug for each of us. Which you should have brought. I know. I thought about, it, but it wouldn't have made a good tank. I, it would I not justify have, it. Would have clicked. It would have gonk. <laughs> Which, who knows how that yeah. would have sounded. And uh, it's got it's also got my name engraved on it with the date of his wedding on, on the bottom of it. Aww. It's engraved, like burned into it. Uh, but yeah, the, the suits were awesome. Every, hanging out with those guys was awesome. The venue was great. And the food was amazing. And they had they had bottles of dragon's milk. Like, like open bar, just like... Have as many dragon's milk bottles as you want wow. for for because it's one of his favorite beers. Um, I and I got to give a speech and it was awesome. Was everyone it told me I did. I do have a recording of it. I'll show you. <gasps> Macy recorded it. Are you serious? It. Yeah, I'll show you later. Yes, uh, it was fun. I, I, as I said to my wife, some of the jokes that I was worried about that I didn't think would land or was worried about offending people landed fine and people cracked up at them. And then some of the jokes I thought were shoe in didn't land at all or didn't oh. or landed weirdly and i was huh. like huh. so uh next time i know to be as offensive as possible <laughs> or to have more confidence in your humor and not i was confident, confident. I, I was oh yeah i see what you mean so yeah it was it was a fun it was a fun time i will say though I, as my wife said i got a little white girl wasted and Uh-oh. that night, I for the first time in a very long time mm. got sick off of alcohol. Oh. So I was puking in my parents' toilet. That filet mignon tasted wow. great a second time. <laughs> Ew. <laughs> yeah, it was. Did it was uh, did your son make that the best experience for you as possible? What do you mean? Uh, usually, since I've had children uh-huh. and I now have two, it's whenever I decide to go a little ham yeah. on an evening, and I wake up at one or five mm-hmm. or three or four in the morning, not because I'm sick or because I've drank too much, but because my kids are needing me in the middle of the night, mm. make it worse. Yes. And so they teach me the lesson uh, three, four times over <laughs> to stop doing that. Yeah, no, he did. It was, I started throwing up right after I had to like rock him back to sleep. 
because he woke up at, mm. he woke up at one thirty, was up till two thirty. That's when I was able to rock him to sleep. Mm-hmm. Apparently, in an inebriated state, so good on me, I guess. No, and then I went back to bed, and no. So I think this is exactly what happened. I think I would have been fine, even with like three dragons milks in me, which are each like eleven percent alcohol mm-hmm. and a couple other beers and maybe a glass of wine. I had way too much to drink. I think it might have been okay. I think I might have made it through. But what I did was right after putting my son to bed or right after getting him to sleep, I was yep. like, I was like, I think I'm past the worst of it. I'm gonna go get a glass of water to rehydrate. Better. chugging the glass of water like an it. idiot i think is what just like i think it just threw my mm. stomach chemistry all for a whack and that's when i started throwing up mm. so i was up till about like 4 30 in the morning and then i was and i fell back asleep woke up again felt fine felt great felt better than i did like i was like i'm probably dehydrated right now but i don't care i feel so good wow <laughs> so, yeah it was, it was a very very <laughs> very fun weekend with a little bit of crappy puking in between did so. you get a nap what do you mean? Did you nap that day? Yeah, like, I did. Yeah, mm-hmm. I came home and napped. Mm-hmm. Once because we had to drive home two yeah, hours, so right. and then after yeah. that, I think at some point I napped. I think at that point my son did. Anyway, so yes, wedding was awesome, wonderful. So again, congratulations, Aaron and Heather, Hethron, as I call them, and uh, their couple name and, like Kath uh, Ryan. Yeah, like Kath Ryan. Yeah. <laughs> Shout out to you, Ryan. <laughs> Hethron. Uh, but yeah, so that's my favorite thing. Yay, favorite things is over. Woo! Woo! Uh, which leads us to We're our next segment. We're not ready beer. for our next beer, but we'll do it before we go into our main topic. There so this go. is for um, the segment. But I love this beer, man. I don't want to make it last. This is so good. It's so good. All right, but our next segment is... DLC. Downloadable content is the next segment of our show where we have a discussion about video games that you wouldn't necessarily normally think to have. Sometimes it's related to our topic, sometimes it's not. And tonight, it's definitely not. This is the second night in a row, actually. Yeah, yeah not, about that. So, uh, Catch me outside. But your idea for DLC was, was nice, my... so why don't you introduce it? it? My idea for this DLC is coming at you twofold, from two different angles. One, it's Christmas time. Thanksgiving just happened. Christmas is about to happen. We're seeing a lot of family. Mm-hmm. We're having a lot of interactions with folks we don't normally interact with, extended family, etc. But also, it's very relevant because... The holidays is a time for parents and children. And also, you heard about this in another podcast, right? I did. This was discussed on Game Over Games. Nope. Why? There on was the PlayStation two. There was guys. the second reason why I cared about this topic so much. I hate when my brain stops working. Gah. It'll come to me later. Okay. So we're going to talk about, and my DLC is, Bleh. do your parents play video games? Mm-hmm. How do your parents feel about video games? And have you ever tried... Oh! There it was. The second, <laughs> the second reason is the relevancy of the meme, OK Boomer. OK Boomer. That's, that's the right. second point. That's that was the was. second inspiration of this, this question. Wow, okay, you're so, so excited that you I figured was. that out. It clicked right mid. I knew it would. I knew it would. And you're free to edit whatever you got to edit. I will. <laughs> all right. So whatever audience you hear is after Penguin edits and cuts the crap out of all of this. So do your parents play video games? How do your parents feel about video games? Have you ever tried to get your parents into games? And I say that it's relevant to the OK Boomer because I'm thinking the demographic of our podcast is late 20s, yeah. early 30s. Yeah, I we think. might be lucky to have some Gen Z listeners. Maybe. We definitely have a lot of millennials. Right. I'm sorry, not Gen Z. I meant Gen X. Gen X, right. Gen X listeners, yeah. And, yeah. We'd be lucky to have either Gen Z or Gen X. Right. But not you millennials. Get out of here. Yeah. <laughs> Get out of here, I know guys. our parents are all boomers, and yeah. so that's, that's, that's what made me think about it. Mm-hmm. Anyway... Do you do you want to go first? Yeah, sure. Go. Uh, my parents do not play video games. My I don't even think they play cell phone games. Mm-hmm. Um, but well, okay, that's not true. Yeah, my dad will play things like Words with Friends and stuff like that. Uh, wasn't there? There was yeah, any of those like cell phone games that involve like word puzzles and stuff like that that you can play mm-hmm. with or against people. He'll he'll do that. He like played an a lot of yeah. scrambler. Yeah. Word thing. yeah. Yep. 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 Mm. Those kind of things. Other than that, that are like already existing games that have just been imported into a social media kind of platform. Uh, he does not really play. No, neither of my parents play games. My dad and my mom. I think they always thought of games as something for kids. For me as a kid, so a lot of my like discussions with them have been not so much trying to convince them to play games, but more to convince them that games are like can be a serious, like not thing for kids like a, yeah. or a a serious form of entertainment for as serious a form of entertainment can be you know mm-hmm. what i mean so at least on the level of movies <coughs> or mm-hmm. tv you know what i mean so yeah that's most of my conversations i definitely have had okay boomer conversations with my dad like with, regarding 
you know, oh, video games make people violent. And I'm like, no, they okay, don't. Okay, Boomer. Okay, like, <laughs> my last conversation, I didn't say it because he's my dad, and right. I respect him more to, than, than, to, than to just fire that off. But right. the last conversation, I'm thinking about the last conversation I had with him about it, and I, I part of me was like, okay, Boomer, ignore the, you know, legion of research that indicates that it's not. Mm-hmm. But, uh, yeah, I don't know. I, I've had, I think my mom takes it more seriously than my dad does, though, because because okay. I've had conversations with her, I've been like, Mom, this game, like, explores these themes, and she's open to, like, having conversations about that kind of stuff. Mm. But my dad, I'm just, he's, he's his yeah. kid stuff. Mm. So, yeah, don't think they play games. So similar, and I feel like a lot of people have the same experience. And So my parents were into Nintendo, like, in the 80s. They played the crap out of Mario. Yeah. They weren't into things like Zelda or uh-huh. Metroid. or You know, they only dipped their toe. So it was just Mario. And then we got a Super Nintendo into the family when it came out. And they loved Mario World. Like, the 16-bit. Like, mm-hmm. they played that. And ever since then, it's always been, like you said, it's a kid's thing. Yeah. They don't really take it seriously. And sometimes I'll drop, like, little nuggets of, you know... It's cool to see how the gaming industry grew up with us. And yeah, like, yeah, yeah. It started as a kid's marketed towards as a toy, but n- now those kids now make games for us as adults. And s- I try to express, and I'm horrible at articulating it, yeah. but like, I try to express the importance of gaming and how like deep those themes can be yeah. and how it, like expansive the stories are and, and the things that we see these days in modern gaming, mm-hmm. right? Like, you can take... Battlefield One, for example, right. and explore World War One. Even though it's fiction, they're still like based on some mm-hmm. sort of you know diary entries. It's and, and truth that happened in World War yeah. One, but you're exploring an area of something you wouldn't normally think about yeah. in a more realistic way. And the interactivity is its own like piece of the puzzle, right? Yeah, and I mean we've talked all about things like like Hey, Dad, I think you would get a lot out of this game that basically is a is a thesis on fatherhood yeah right (laughs) aka god of war you know what i mean i do wonder how much of it's a bit of an ouroboros though of of factors where it's like we appreciate games as as an entertainment medium because we grew up with it and it grew up with us and we can recognize it whereas like and it's still marketed towards us, whereas, like, they are a whole generation removed from us. Their values and their experiences are mm. different from ours from their formative years. And games were not targeted towards them when they started emerging. So right. I do wonder, like, unless, you know, I'm sure we have boomers, or I'm sure there are boomers out there, and maybe we're lucky to have some listeners who are boomers who play video games. That'd be great. Uh, I would love to hear But that. the majority of boomers, I'm sure, just it's just not something that has ever really grabbed their attention because it was never really meant to. Mm. So, And one other aspect, which I will say, I will totally give credit. This is uh, Colin Moriarty's podcast called Sacred Symbols, referring to the PlayStation, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. like I did in my sweater. Uh, but that's the name of his podcast. Uh, he's the one that had a writer write in, and they had a discussion about this, which is part of the also the, the third prong, if you will, of my inspiration for this topic and discussion, was that parents of the of that generation have only experienced gaming when it was new and that was 2D. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It was 2D. So the idea of the third dimension throws them off like crazy. Yeah. And so like the idea of a first person shooter or even a third person where you're moving a camera and not the character, so to speak, like with yep. one mm-hmm. you have two joysticks, right? One moves the character and one moves the camera. Yeah. Or it's and, like I said and you're turning. So I like, explained one time too, I think my wife, I said one's moving your feet and one's moving your head. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And we grew up instinctively, with, yep. With the uh, like N64 like started that with Turok yeah, yeah, yeah. and Goldeneye, like we learned that early on and evolved through Halo, etc. and in, into the modern era and we have keyboard mouse on the pc side they never had any of that Mm -hmm. right the last thing they may have played or experienced was arcades in the 70s and 80s which we had our 80s discussion with with kevin in previous episodes where how prominent video gaming was was just the arcades yeah they didn't have these big 3d open world sprawling quest you know things back then and so i wonder if if that's just intimidating like these that there's a barrier of entry that's like they can't break that idea of Mm. And I imagine so they, there's a lot of, you know, you hear people talk about video games and you hear all the, like, if you're on the outside looking in, there's just all this jargon yeah. and all this, like, lingo. It's it's a learning curve. It really is a learning curve to get into gaming. And I think uh, there's a similar barrier of entry with, any like, any non-gamer, mm-hmm. even of your generation. You know what I mean? Like, trying to – imagine trying to explain all, like, all that kind of stuff to your wife. Right. I mean, and which your wife has played video games before. My wife, last time she played video games, she was, like – 
eight. Right. <laughs> you know what I mean? And she never really got into it. So, mm. like, I remember trying to sit down and play Halo with her once, and it was just like trying to explain basic things like yeah one moves your head and one moves your feet i still don't get it i don't know how to move i'm running off a right. cliff like and now i'm getting stressed you know what i mean it's, it's exactly like what uh, I'm talking about. yeah i think it happens it happens to anyone who's just outside of the mm-hmm. but the the largest swath of those that demographic of people who are non-gamers are probably our parents generation right yeah and my wife similarly had watched me play borderlands and laughed at the humor and the yeah, stuff yeah. this is like back in borderlands 2 uh-huh. era and she wanted to play it. So we fired it up split screen. Here you go. Here's a controller. Same experience. Mm-hmm. Like the idea of the 3D first person, like moving around camera separate from feet thing threw her off so much. That she was just like, this is not easy. Yeah. And it, it, she wasn't raised doing that. Yep. So mm-hmm. that was it. All right, cool. Well, we can probably end there. Yeah. It's a great discussion. It, it is. It's almost becoming its own mini topic. It, yeah, so let's yeah. go ahead and stop while we're ahead and fire up our next beer, which we don't even need to pour right. or anything. Let's just it's already it. poured. It's already poured, ready to go because we were letting it warm up a bit because it was recommended okay. that it was at 55 degrees, right? It was. That's what the box said. So this is the cream of the crop. We saved the best for last. Best for last. This is Firestone's. Firestone Walker has a blend of barrel-aged beers, and they release it every <sighs> year. It's called the Anniversary Ale. And this year is the 22. Well, actually, it's the 2018 Vintage. Yes. 22nd Anniversary Ale Special Limited Release. Again, provided by Sean. Yay, he's Sean. Awesome. He so bought good. this specifically for us for this podcast. Um, You're going to read some select parts, so, right? Because so it, it came with a with scroll. A, <laughs> it came with a scroll. Uh, and I'm trying to figure out like what parts of this are relevant. Do you it was think re- that word being facetious? No, it was no, literally, literally rolled I, I like a it, scroll. I have yeah. it in my hand. Like, I mean, it's ma- from ma- not made from papyrus or anything. It is paper, but <laughs> it was rolled this like is a scroll. Fantastic. Uh, so I'm going to read parts of this thing because yes. it would take. I would you guys would go to sleep if I read the whole thing. So here we go. Though we toyed with the notion of doing. We did. <laughs> I thought I thought about trolling all of you. It's like I'm reading this whole thing. Cool. That's our podcast. <laughs> right. And just <laughs> click. script. Yep. All right. So. Uh, here's what it, here's part of it. Since founding our brewery in 1996, we have specialized in the rare art of brewing beer and oak barrels. In the fall of 2006, we released a limited edition oak aged strong ale called Ten to commemorate our 10th anniversary. The experience was greater than any of us could have ever imagined. We now present 22, our 13th release in what has become an annual autumn rite at our brewery. And I want to talk about the other segment I want to read is the blend because that's what makes this beer special. And so there's a whole blurb about their history and all this stuff. So I'm talking about the the blend. This beer is all about the barrels. Bourbon, rum, and gin barrels combine Mm. forces to create incredible complexity. The stout percentage is restrained, allowing the wood to speak and be heard. I especially like the way the gin barrels bring new spice notes that we would have not seen before in the anniversary blend. I will let you discover the rest. This beer is unfiltered and unfined, so there will be a small amount of sediment at the bottom of the bottle. I didn't know that when I poured it, so Good to know. I'm glad we set it, let it set for a minute. 22 is best poured carefully into half-filled brandy, snifter, or wine glasses. That's exactly what they're in. Uh, oh. Allow it to warm to 55 to fully enjoy the pleasing and complex aromas, which Penguin just did. Oh. And you, you heard that. The true complexity of this blend is revealed as the beer sits and breathes in the glass. So take your time. If you wait to open your bottle later, store it in a cold, dark place. Like our other anniversary offer offerings, this beer will age well and change favorably for years to come. We didn't do that. We drank it. It's one year right aged. Out. Right Right out. So there it is, and it's a strong ale aged in bourbon, rum, and gin barrels. So All right, let's give it a shot. I don't know up. anything about this. I haven't even smelled it yet. Oh, my gosh. Okay, you just took a sip. I just smelled it. I'm going to step behind you. Mm, it's good. It smells- <laughs> Very boozy. It's like it It's almost like drinking a- It's just It's like drinking liquor <laughs> right now, but not as strong. Just not as strong. I'm trying to find an ABV- on this thing and there are there are no negative words for this beer so i'm avoiding all words that could possibly be misinterpreted it is very 12.7 percent and luckily we're splitting this because Mm -hmm. our podcast would just be slurs (laughs) obscenities if we drink these fruity actually it smells i haven't tasted it yet i've just been smelling it and experiencing the the barrels that they talk about so bourbon take a sip take a sip because we gotta talk about fruity (laughs) are are we gonna talk wow (laughs) Mm. Wow, it is very fruity. Yeah, and I imagine it's it's got to be like wine barrels, like right? yeah. No, they just said 
liquor barrels. They said gin. There was gin in there, but I don't. It's just a blend of good and rum. deliciousness. It's got to be the rum. So it's it's a mixture yeah, the rum of is sweet. Sticky Monkey, which is aged in bourbon barrel. These are their different beers from Firestone Walker. It's Sticky Monkey, Parabola, Bravo, Rum Barrel, Hell Dorado, and Gin Barrel, Hell Dorado. And yeah, that fruitness, that sweet fruitiness, has got to be the the rum. rum. Yep. Yeah. It's good. I like and then, it. Like yeah, you can definitely tell the. It's gin. very complex. There's a lot going so on. Much. Almost too much to like really be able to put to words. I know that sounds like a cop out, but it's it very complex. Yeah, it's extremely co- complex. Yeah, but we do we need to talk about obsidian, which is also yes. extremely complex. So it's <laughs> yeah. a good pairing. It is <laughs> for our topic tonight. Our main topic. All right, 30 main topic. Minutes into our discussion. Yeah, Ooh, a little bit. Uh, we are talking about obsidian entertainment today as our developer profile. So, and we chose this because the relevancy of Outer Worlds, which just mm-hmm. came out and is, and is nominated as a yep. Game of the Year contender. Exactly. So, and it might be a developer that you guys have not, as you alluded to earlier, you may not know what they've created, where they came right. from, who they are. You'd be very surprised. So, because they don't make a lot of stuff and they're relatively new. Mm-hmm. Yep. So, uh, we'll start with just the basics. Who are they, and what games are they known for, and what is their story? Obsidian Entertainment Incorporated is an American video game developer based in Irvine, California. Is that how you pronounce that? I don't Irving. Know. Irvine. Irvine. Uh, it was founded in June 2003, which is why I say it's relatively new, because that was before, right before the PS3 and the Xbox 360 came out. In fact, they have one entry in the Xbox One original, shortly before the closure of Black Isle Studios by ex Black Isle employees, uh, Fear. Fergus, 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 Erghart. I'm just gonna say Erghart. I don't know how to pronounce yeah, that. Yeah, um, Chris Avalone, Chris Parker, Darren Monahan, and Chris Jones. Uh, and they have developed. What are they known for? What's their story? So Black Isle Studios was a developer. They had a bunch of IP, which I'll list in a minute. And they broke away because Black Isle Studios failed to continue to get work. And yeah, they were kind of squandered, like floundering, like yep. to get the next. What game are they gonna make? So uh, they broke off, started Obsidian, and the first contract they landed was actually, like, they courted Ubisoft, EA, other big names with ideas for different games, but finally landed on LucasArts. Yeah, LucasArts approached them. Yeah. LucasArts approached them. It was the other way around because of their history at Black Isle, Uh which we'll get to. So uh, you guys might know them. Their original title was Star Wars Knights of the Old Republic 2. Yes. So they they developed the follow-up to BioWare's... Knights of the Old Republic, right? One, mm-hmm. I was again. It took me when we did we do a did we do a developer profile on Bioware? We haven't yet, have we? When Anthem first started coming around, it was surprising huh. to me to learn that the people who made Anthem were the ones who made Knights of the Old Republic. I never put two and two together until later. I was like, oh, that's right. I didn't real. I also didn't realize they didn't make their own follow up. So Obsidian made the follow up right. to Bioware's, and I. I don't remember if it was it was very well received. It had some bugs and technical issues I was reading on launch. Yeah. But the game was very well received. I don't mm-hmm. know if people consider it better than Kotor no, 1. Not. It's yeah. not better than Kotor yeah. 1. Okay. I but mean, I wouldn't. That's Termite's opinion, but sure. I got I got 2 thirds of the way Still through the game and solid didn't follow up. I do yep. before we go too far into the games they're known for, I will say that while they were under Black Isle, yeah. They made Fallout 2, mm-hmm. Neverwinter Nights 1. Mhm. And a couple other ones. So they're actually a very well known, uh, you know, well, whether they're under Black Isle or whether they're under Obsidian, they're very well known. You'll see a trend here. They're very well known for making sequels to existing franchises as opposed to a lot of intellectual property of their own. Mm-hmm. Um, but we will get, we'll get more into that. They made Baldur's Gate 1 and 2. Baldur's Gate. And Icewind Did Dale. they do one? Yep. Okay, cool. Yep. And uh, that was all Black Isle. And they did. Um Planetscape Torment, which were all super popular, really, really early PC RPGs. And that is when they were under... Black Isle. Black Isle. Okay. So I remember I read they they toss around a bunch of different names for what their new new, uh, development studio would be called, and they landed on Obsidian because of how close it was to Black Isle. So Black Ah. black and Obsidian is a stone that is usually appears black so yeah i didn't know that yep huh. little bits um i got all my information from wikipedia so what else is very city and developed yep okay uh they've developed uh you know neverwinter nights 2 they ended up re-getting fallout in the fallout franchise with new vegas bethesda approached them to make new vegas for them which was kind of a spin-off of fallout 3 using the fallout 3 mm-hmm. engine correct yeah. okay yeah. just want to make sure i got that right they made south park the stick of truth which mm. is Freaking awesome. I didn't yeah, realize that. They yeah, didn't dude. make Fractured But Whole, but right. they made Stick of Truth. Yeah. Both excellent games, but yeah. 
Uh, that's surprising to me that they made Stick of what Truth. What platform did you play Stick of Truth on? The very first time I ever touched Stick of Truth was actually on an Xbox because I okay. I fired it up on my I was house sitting for my at the time not sister in law but I, I knew them and they they were living in Harrisonburg Bree. and Bree um, mm-hmm. Brizzle McFizzle yeah Brizzle McFizzle and Mike they were living in the same town as me at the time um, needed someone to watch their house while they went on vacation or whatever watch their dog so I went over they were like they they plied me by saying you can play Stick of Truth at our house and I was like sweet so I played it that the first time I actually played it proper on my own system was a PC did you find Steam. it buggy or not on Steam it was actually excellent on clunky at all nope. I played it on PS3. Oh, nice. And it was trash. As far as performance and bugs, it locked up. It had low frame rates. It skipped. Mm. It had some glitches and bugs. I had to restart the game several times. I, I didn't know if that was a PlayStation thing or Maybe? if that was I don't know. I don't Obsidian remember. Or... I remember playing it on Steam and having no complaints at the okay. time. So. I'm yes. going to blame PlayStation on that <laughs> okay. one then, yeah. and not Obsidian. Uh, the other two franchises they're known for that are that are like their IPs, their original IPs, Pillars of Eternity and The Outer Worlds, Mm -hmm. which Pillars of Eternity is interesting. Both of these games are interesting, but Pillars of Eternity is interesting because it was a spiritual successor to Baldur's Gate, Mm -hmm. isometric RPG. Right. And it was crowdfunded. It was Mm -hmm. Kickstarter game because they were falling on financial hard times. This was in the the fallout (laughs) of Fallout New Vegas where they were given they weren't given their bonus we talked about this on our on our metacritic episode on our game ratings episode they were not given their bonus for they were they were promised a bonus if they reached a certain metacritic score of 85 was it yep and they scored 84 and so bethesda Mm. withheld their bonus right so uh they've kind of were under financial pressure and they needed funding to make their next game so they made pillars of eternity through kickstarter it's so cool. ironic because yeah. so many fallout fans say new vegas is the best the best fallout. yes isn't that it crazy four and 76 fallout 4 and fallout 76 did not beat their the fandom of what new vegas is yeah and i haven't personally played new vegas have you mm-hmm. i have i have played the first like hour or so of that game do you mm-hmm. have it what, what platform do you have it on steam also okay, so you have it already it's good mm-hmm. you could play it if you wanted to yeah. mm-hmm. okay i've got it on uh, PS- i could so i the part of the reason why i stopped playing it was because i kept running into serious issues with the game really it kept crashing because of the i think it was windows 10 maybe uh, or something it had some kind of compatibility issue okay. with yeah do you still have your 360 no I sold it oh, okay. sold it to buy the wii u actually ah. which now i'm planning to sell <laughs> to well, <there's- laughs> sell <somewhere. laughs> Well, I have it on Xbox 360 and PlayStation 3, so it's if, supposedly the if best. You wanted I mean, to borrow it, and somehow, so I think I don't know how that's going to happen. One but. of the things I think people appreciate about it was like the robust like dialogue system in the game. Yeah, like it had very very detailed dialogue responses. Some of them very snarky. Yeah, and I think that they were able to recreate that in Outer Worlds, which is the like, yeah. getting back around so, to yeah, it. Yep, Outer Here Worlds came yep. uh, is their most recent game they made, mm-hmm. and it is a new IP, mm-hmm. and it is a not just spiritual successor, but very much. Fallout New Vegas and everything but IP. <laughs> yep. It is Fallout New Vegas with a different, completely different, without, you know, running into copyright laws. So, right. so there's uh, also a Pillars of Eternity 2, by the way. Yes, yes, yeah. yes. Pillars so, of Eternity, yeah. Mm-hmm. That's one and two. their only, like, quote, franchise yes, that has more than one entry yes, is right. Pillars mm-hmm. of Eternity that belongs exclusively to Obsidian. Mm-hmm. Yep, exactly. So mm-hmm. that answers one of our, one of their popular franchises. <laughs> As it's the only one with two entries. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So we should have addressed this earlier in our discussion from the introduction, is that this is Microsoft's most recent acquisition yes. as a exclusive developer for them. Mm-hmm. So, so now, everything they make going forward, yep, theoretically, will be Microsoft, Microsoft. exclusive. Yep. And they announced at the Microsoft XO19, they showed off a new game. From, Another from new them. IP. Another is... new IP. Honey, I Shrunk the Kids survival <laughs> game, which I don't remember the name of it at all. Grounded. It, it, thank you. Yep. I'm glad you. I'm glad one of us does because like <laughs> I was racking my brain trying to figure out what the title of this game was, and all I could think of was Honey, I Shrunk the Kids. Uh, it's the backyard like ants are the size of you building things, kind of Fortnite, Minecraft, uh-huh. but yet survival. I think it's. I think it's in the co-op. vein. What it what it comes across to me is not so much Fortnite where it's battle royale, though it may end up it's, being. I don't that. think. Yeah. I'm, I, I, don't, agree. I don't think it's. I don't think it's battle royale. I think it's more in line with like Ark, where there's still PvP aspects, yep. but it's yeah, more yeah. of like a survival MMO, mm-hmm. where it's just this big open world, everyone's trying to survive. Right. 
but it's like everything. There's, there's, there's like a, giant baseballs that you can like build structures on and stuff yeah. like that. Yeah. There's a game called Don't Starve. Have you ever heard of that or played it? It's an indie game. I, I'm familiar. It feels like with it. so. It's like you have your hunger and your, uh-huh, your yeah. needs. You have to survival. Like yep. right. Mm-hmm. Don't die. Game. Yep. Yeah. I feel like it's that. Anyway, that's Obsidian. They now are... So that deal happened before um, Outer Worlds came out. And there was a lot of speculation Uh about would Outer Worlds play better on Xbox? Would it play better on Windows 10 than everything else? Uh, There was this whole rumor speculation thing about there's no 4K or HDR support on the PS4 Pro for Sony. All that's false. It's fine. It's a it's a totally truly third party game. Mm-hmm. So anyway, yep, it's that's probably their last one though for a yeah, while. It is. So unless they that, that's what they I'm saying. Through. That's exactly what I'm saying. They definitely. Um, I, I remember reading that one of their one of their goals was they their their founder Fer- Fergus Urquhart or whatever whoever their CEO is. Mm-hmm. It's hard to say his name. So if you ever Urquhart. listen to Just this, say Urquhart. If you ever say this, Mister Urquhart, uh, we're sorry. We're sorry for butchering your name. <laughs> He, I remember he reading a quote though for him saying that he says we have no problem making sequels, especially if there are sequels to already good games. Yep. And he actually said actually saves us on development time, like assets and yeah. stuff like that, asset creation. Yep. He said though their goal is to eventually make their own IPs. It seems like they're getting to that point. It seems like now they people are, are like, yeah. it seems like for a while people only trusted them with existing IPs, and now they're getting to that point where they are a highly trusted developer that is able to make their own IPs. Yeah, if you look at. So it's the first game they ever made was a second a sequel, right? Mm-hmm. Night Seal Republic, which Bioware actually had people help them out in the development of that. Then you had Neverwinter Nights 2, which was a bio... I think it was Bioware as well. I don't know. It was someone else that was making D&D games. I don't remember. I don't it's, either. It's blanking. I apologize. But it doesn't matter, yeah. So anyway, it was a sequel, so they Neverwinter Nights 2 was... A, but the they people, did also make Neverwinter Nights 1. They assisted from Black Isle. From Black Isle, right? when they were so in, but they, they were the same people, guys. Right. Yeah. So then there's Fallout New Vegas, which they had Bethesda support on from Fallout, and then you have South Park Stick of Truth, which they had... Uh, Trey Parker and Mark uh, Matt, sorry, Stone. Matt Stone, mm-hmm. which helped them make. So, everyone... but they also so that was also originally was a different publisher, and then got bought by Ubisoft. Ah, oh, because yeah. Ubisoft was trying. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Ubisoft has a whole cut. Co- we did. We need to do a developer profile on Ubisoft because they're nuts. <laughs> they're more anyway, like a publisher profile, but they, yeah, right. It is. But there was a no. There was some. I remember reading. I don't remember who had it first. Again, I'm blanking on developers. I should have taken better notes. But Acclaim? there was. There was some other publisher that had South Park Stick of Truth and mm-hmm. that was developing alongside of, like, helping Obsidian. Yeah. And then that fell through and it went up for bidding. And they were worried that no one was going to end up getting it and the whole thing was going to be canceled. But then mm-hmm. Ubisoft purchased it at the last second. So, oh, gotcha. yeah. All that to say is those were the, Obsidian's, like, early stuff when they first started from 2003 to, I don't know when Stick of Truth came out, it was, it was 2013, 14, something like that. Yeah. Something like that. Uh, and then Pillars of Eternity 1 and 2 and The Outer Worlds are finally their own IP. Yeah, Which exactly. goes right into what so, I mean, Urquhart said, was where we eventually want to get to our own IP, and they did. And they so did. It's the so, last three it's so games crazy to think about <laughs> that they had the, it's so different from all the other <laughs> developer profiles we've done. I mean, everything else we've done, Insomniac, Naughty Dog. Capcom. Capcom and Rockstar have all been they lived and breathed on their own IP for right. a long time. In fact, there were controversies over like they created these IPs and then they ended up in the hands of other publishers mm-hmm. and like that has been a lot of the developer profiles we've covered. Yeah. This is the first one we've covered that really built the foundation on jumping into other IPs and making them good mm-hmm. and then eventually getting to the point where they were able to make their own. It's kind of cool. So, it is. it's a very different story. It is. So, yep. Um, also, again, they have a very obviously they have a very touchy past with Bethesda. I, I'm really I would be interested to see what their thoughts on Bethesda were. Seeing how Bethesda's kind of they've made some of the best entries. Fallout Two and Fallout New Vegas were made by Black Isle and Obsidian, respectively. Right. And now they've made Outer Worlds as a direct competitor to them. Mm-hmm. I can't help but think there's some sort of sticking it to Bethesda. Bethesda has Skyrim though. That's true. They have but Skyrim. it's a whole different. You know what I mean? It's not so much. It's not so much they're trying to like bring down Bethesda, but they do they do kind of make Bethesda look bad, especially considering Outer Worlds came out right when the Fallout first thing was happening. Yeah, it was yeah, announced yeah. right when Fallout, mm-hmm. Fallout 76 first was announced and all that stuff. So I, th- I think Bethesda's fine. But I'm sure they're fine. I just I wonder how Obsidian software, feels. I wonder how Obsidian feels probably about not even, them. Probably, probably not. Even. We're probably reading more into it. Yeah, than you I, are. Yeah. I, I all think right. you are. All right. What is your favorite Obsidian game? <laughs> this is a problem. Oh, for no. Me. Out of all the games that we've listed, I've only played... Knights of the Republic 2 and South Park Stick of Truth. 
So okay. of the two of those, of course I'm going to say Star yeah. Wars. Like, no. Oh, really? I yeah. thought you were going to say South Park. I played all the way through Stick of Truth. It was a fantastic game. It was yeah. hilarious. It had an awesome battle system, awesome mechanics, and a hilarious story with good characters and all those things. But I'm a Star Wars. Ooh. Wow. I don't know uh, if you guys even heard that. Whatever. Maybe you will. Maybe you won't. You clicked a couple glasses together because our table is full of empty glasses now. <laughs> so Star Wars Knights of the Republic 2 – I I have it is a near I wish so bad that those games would be ported forward to the current yeah. generation. I want to play them through again. They're so good. Yeah. Uh, and I loved 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 Knights of the Republic two. Even though I can't remember a single thing about that <laughs> game specifically. If you asked me a character's name, I'm Darth Revan. Right. Well, duh. That's the main <laughs> antagonist or or protagonist Ooh. from the first game. Intriguing. Spoiler alert. Uh, and yeah. So. That's I'm gonna say Star Wars Knights of the Republic two. All right, was my favorite Obsidian game. I'm I'm gonna say it's South Park. It's Stick of Truth. Yeah. Uh, but again, it was a very surprising when I was reading their list of games. I was surprised to see that on the list when I first saw it. Like, so, Whoa. which just goes to show that like I didn't even realize it. So mm. it's, it's it's a both a like demonstration of my own lack of knowledge of these things, yeah. but also like a pleasant surprise to realize. Oh yeah, like you can feel that like when you look back, you can feel that sort of Obsidian. Yep flavor on it mm. i definitely have pillars of eternity one or two i don't remember i have one of them through a twitch prime thing where i got Aren't a free they game free to play? i thought they were maybe i'm getting them mixed mm, up with path i think of you're exile. getting them mixed up with path of exile so yeah. yeah uh pillars of eternity is not i don't think it's free to play but i have one of them so i'm Looking very up. interested in firing it up uh at some point because of this especially podcast. now mm-hmm. right i have obviously i've touched I have touched the first few hours of both New Vegas and Outer Worlds, and my dislike of them has more to do with my own personal personal feelings towards the games of just, I don't know, I just don't, can't get into it. But I also recognize they're very good games, so I do think they're... Pillars of Eternity 1 is $50 on PlayStation right now. Interesting. Wow. That's expansive. Expansive. Yep. Uh, well, I have one of them free on on Twitch. Nice. <laughs> but yeah, the uh I recognize Fallout New Vegas and Outer Worlds both as very good games. Mm. Just for and and both of those games I have tried multiple times to get into. I want to like those games and just for whatever reason mm. haven't been able to. So, you know, maybe Outer Worlds is going to be somewhere in my future if I can either borrow it on PlayStation or get it the holiday season How are you isn't borrow over. It? Who's getting it? I don't know. I don't <laughs> You're not getting it, actually. <laughs> You're not getting it from me, at least. We have a, a video throw that game out there. exchange yeah, we do. coming next week. And it'll be on the next episode of this podcast. And I thought I just caught Dan you in did. a slip. You actually did it. So Darn. Good. Yeah, All sorry. Right. I, I, I don't want to. I also, I want to try to avoid deconfirming games. But in this right. case, you were so convinced that I was, it was. I was like, oh. I was like no, I'm just going to deconfirm I'm going to borrow it. Oh, how are you gonna I borrow? do want anyway. to borrow it if someone ends up getting it. Yeah. And if if not, if I end up getting it, the, the holiday season isn't over either. That's um true. so I might I'm gonna get beginning it as well. How about that? And I think I might like it more on PlayStation than I did. I just played it on through the PC. Xbox Game Pass yeah. and I just for whatever whatever reason wasn't into it. Maybe it was just the fact of it was sitting on my lap. Mm-hmm. So maybe I just need to get it with a controller in my hands. Either way, it doesn't matter. I'm very interested in getting into those games I just haven't yet. And yep. haven't it hasn't clicked with me yet. But I recognize that they are the kinds of games I like. Rich, interesting narratives, deep, meaningful choices. It's just that combat that I can't get. It just doesn't yeah. feel satisfying to me. But apparently you play the whole game without using much combat. You can be, you can, you yeah, can be chari- you can. charismatic, and you can be influential, hmm. and you can avoid conflict. Maybe I just do that. Maybe and I try playing I absolutely like that. adore and love everything Fallout. I absolutely mm-hmm. adore and love everything Bioshock, and I feel like Outer Worlds is the perfect marriage it's very, of yeah, it feels, Fallout and yeah. Bioshock. Mm-hmm. And we'll get there because... How has Obsidian brought innovation to the industry? Boom. Segway's in there somewhere. It's, it's a, always It's a there. half segue because <laughs> the third, the next question is actually the real segue. We'll get there. So how they brought innovation to the industry, I'm going to say they really haven't yet. Mm. Uh, they're starting to. And I'm going to say this because when the founders were a part of Black Isle, that's when they were innovative. And I, they were mm, yeah. the pioneers of of getting the Dungeons and Dragons complexity of an RPG, like the depth, the immersion, and the dark, like deep dungeon aspect. Yeah. Like they had that. In Baldur's Gate 1 and 2, in Icewind Dale, and Torment, they had those games, those like feelings in there. And they had, they were, 
the the grandfather of games like Diablo, yeah. right? Or we have the the modern isometric RPG. We've talked about yep. RTSs in the past. We talked about different types of games in our podcast. Uh, they started that. So mm-hmm. their main innovation was actually through Black Isle before they became yep. Obsidian. Yeah, and so that what what has kind of gimped them in the innovation spectrum is that they've only taken on existing IP up yeah. until Pillars of Eternity one and two, which I haven't played, mm-hmm. and Outer Worlds, which yeah. seems like a good follow up to Fallout, but not really innovative. It's not really it's changing. Just, it's just a the lot. next Fallout it's New Vegas plus without plus. stripped from the IP, stripped of the actual IP that right. makes a Fallout. Fallout. Yeah, yeah, it makes it a Fallout. And so game, I, exactly. I don't see like a groundbreaking innovation. It's just a continuation or maybe an iteration of what yeah what they did I think, with Fallout. I think they're innovate. The way they brought innovation is much less. It's smaller. I do think that they are leading the charge in these very robust. RPGs, and what yeah. I mean by that is, is it seems like they are they are very much leaders. And yes, they may be picking up picking that charge up from, but they've shown that that a, a developer can take an IP and run with it in a way that is still moving things forward mm-hmm. without compromising the identity of that intellectual property. That's a great way to look at it. Yeah, I like and it. I do think that again, the fact that. New New Vegas is recognized in the Fallout franchise as a kind of standout title, if that makes sense. You know, one of my favorite memes is like, is like, I you know, it shows like each Fallout game, Fallout's uh, I think for starting from three, it's like three, four, and and seventy six. It's like it's like I am one of the first survivors. I am the lone wanderer. You know, all these like very serious BA things, and yeah. then it comes to New Vegas. It's like I'm just a postman. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like they bring a very you know like special feel of like of of a blend of humor and robust kind of those robust dialogue choices people often compare they show new vegas the dialogue choices of all these very long sarcastic biting responses you can give people versus in fallout 4 where it's like yes okay sure (laughs) you know what i mean so they definitely i think that the innovation they bring is sort of fleshing out Mm. uh is sort of a fleshing out of these rpgs um that more i would i wish that more developers would lay and lean into Mm. yeah that's there, my, that would be my answer. There's a slight irreverent historical humor that I can't really put words to that Fallout does really well that I feel like Obsidian also does. It's like this kind of sarcastic, witty, backhanded compliment type of humor that existed in all of their stuff. Yeah. Even from like, Night, I'm sorry, Icewind Dale or Baldur's Gate 1 and 2. Yeah. And those, those games I've dabbled in, but I haven't really played through in earnest. Uh, but Fallout New Vegas and Outer Worlds is rampant with it's it. So much, with it. yep. And that's where I pull like the Bioshock feel to it, yeah. or even a Fallout feel to it. Where right. It just has you might this, even like, argue a Borderlands feel yeah, to it as well. Yeah, almost. And, it, and Borderlands is over the top irreverent. Where yeah. I feel like Obsidian isn't it's quite... much more subtly irreverent. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh-huh. It's not. It's not quite in your face irreverent. Yeah, it's but it's definitely like, got. It's got the. It's sort of like it, the game is Fallout, but the world is. Bioshock in the sense that it's got this very stylized feeling of like you're in the 50s but in space. Mm-hmm. And then the irreverence, like a subtle, like a war watered down irreverent Borderlands humor. Yeah. 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 It's interesting. What, uh, do you, you have anything else to add in this innovation wise? Cool. Let's talk about, uh, what is something, and I've, I actually expanded upon this question from our template. Yeah, well, this is a great segue. Yeah. What is something? <laughs> What is something, and it could be a design choice, a story beat, a stylistic choice, etc. What is something that Obsidian includes in several or all of their games, and if applicable? Because in some cases, like that, like we might have a harder time with Obsidian because of their of their past. And we're gonna repeat ourselves a little bit. Yep. Because of the bleed over between the innovations they bring to the industry and their design choices that indicate or what has their like Obsidian name painted all over a game. Uh, and here's what they are like. The, these are the traits they have. A qu- this is what I wrote. The they have a quirky, light humor with a dark twist. They're very comparable of Bethesda's Fallout Three, Four, and Seventy Six. Hence, New Vegas being a good fit for them. You can really see it in current gen Outer Worlds. There's a deep connection between the Dungeons and Dragons systems and deep RPG systems in their Black Isle times and in their early RPGs. Star Wars Knights of the Republic 2 was a great first game to get this company started and put them on the map for this very reason. Yeah, the biggest through line I can connect of of games that have that Obsidian feel to them would be definitely New Vegas and 
Obsidian, having touched them both and seeing sort of that, like I said, mentioned before, that robust dialogue choice system. Yep. Those are kind of the two uh, that I would say that, you know, that blended actually well with South Park's Stick of Truth in sort of that irreverent humor. Oh, absolutely. Obviously. I, mean, yeah. I mean, they obviously had the help of Matt Stone and Trey Parker, but right. they really were a good fit. Mm-hmm. I don't think they could have picked a better fit of that irreverent, subtle, satirical humor mm-hmm. and then had Matt Stone and Trey Parker help them write it was right. was probably one of the better, like, gaming victory, adaptation victories mm-hmm. that we've probably mm-hmm. seen in yeah. the history of gaming. Um, so... You mentioned RPGs. Uh, they seem to make a lot of RPGs. Yep, <laughs> is that's their pretty thing. much all they make? Uh, they did. There were in the Wikipedia entry that we'll link off to. You'll see they they have made other things, but mm-hmm. more importantly, they've gotten a lot of projects that were non RPGs actually canceled. Got canceled. Yeah, not because they were bad games, but because of other factors outside their control. But they they have dipped their toes into other. They're not just RPG makers. They have dipped their toes in other other. Um, genres but a lot of time it seems like a lot of times they dip their toes in other genres that game ends up getting canceled anyways so it's it's very interesting mm. um how that's kind of now you for see them. and this is a good segue into what we expect what do we expect to see obsidian in the future what do we expect of them what do we hope for what we have seen and non-rpg-esque manner is the release of that grounded yep grounded yep that's their new game they're they're like honey i shrunk the kids survival game right yeah so they're that's obviously not a dungeons and dragons dark <laughs> Very witty D&D, rpg yeah. right uh what do we want from them in the future i i don't want that i don't know <laughs> i don't i don't want grounded uh, i'm all. willing to give it a try i'm willing to give it a shot because yeah. it's obsidian it's not my cup of tea, but that doesn't mean there are people who don't like that kind of game and would yeah. appreciate an Obsidian. Oh, I'd never say it shouldn't exist. It should exist. <laughs> I'm all for the existence of Grounded. You just don't want them to continue to make those I kinds don't of games. Play it. You don't want Grounded 2, 3, and 4 to be yeah, the only exactly. games they make yeah. going forward. I think yeah. Obsidian has talents that could be better utilized elsewhere in better genres. So what I want to see is a solid first-party Xbox-exclusive RPG. I want to see... That uh, doesn't exist right yeah, now. Yeah, yeah. I want to see them take their irreverent humor, their great world building, capacity for world building, and their complicated in-depth mechanics, and I want them to make a game that feels more satisfying to play combat-wise. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Because every game I've played you know, f- from them have had, I will say, just generally stiff RPG mechanics in some cases that works fine because it's South Park sick of truth and it's making it's you know satirizing turn-based RPG so it has a turn-based combat system that is fine Mm -hmm. I wanted Outer Worlds Outer Worlds to feel a little bit more like Borderlands in the way that the the combat the movement feels and it's not nope so I would love to see them make a great action RPG, either in either isometrically, like in the in the vein of Diablo, mm-hmm. take that Pillars of Eternity, Baldur's Gate, and make a like an action isometric RPG, or in the form of like a third person behind the shoulder, maybe God of War style RPG. I don't know. I would love to see them make a game that feels fun to play because I like their design style. I like their design choices, their storytelling, their world building, all of that. So much fun. Mm-hmm. But can you imagine like a Witcher style third person oh, RPG like yeah. open world? That's exactly what I want. That's exactly with dialogue with all it, those dialogue choices and everything. Yeah. Like make it'll be that so an good. Xbox exclusive. Make me oh, of course. Make yeah. me want to buy <laughs> the Xbox Scarlet or whatever it's gonna be called. Or sign up on Games Pass for right. PC. Yes. Yeah, like or something. Yeah. However, like compel me to do that. That's what I want Obsidian to do. Yes. They have the potential. Yes. They can do Absolutely. It. I agree. Yep. They are, they are, they have a, the caliber. I just want them to be not so married to the, I want them to kind of uh, experiment with the combat a little bit. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Cool. Learn Sean, from their betters. This beer oh my gosh. is incredible. All of these beers were incredible. Firestone Walker's anniversary ale. I feel Thank like you. we, yeah. Uh, I feel like we've so complex. The best, so many most flavors. interesting beer episode. This, if if there are people out there, I don't know if they exist, but if there are people out there who just listen to us to hear what beer we're drinking and then dip after we talk about the beer, <laughs> that'd be hilarious. I, I want to know about that. Yeah, we do. We want to hear about that. That'd be great. Because uh, if you are out there and exist, we will try harder to get more interesting beers like yeah. the ones on this episode. But. This was an episode for the beer drinkers out it there. It really I was. Think so, for sure. Yeah. There's so many good beers. Almost more so than the Obsidian fans. So, sorry, Obsidian fans who may be listening to Overshadowed this. by the beer. It was definitely overshadowed. Sorry, guys. Sorry. 
But yes, Sean, thank you. We appreciate uh, we appreciate your support of us because clearly, if you're interested in what beers we're drinking, then you're interested in the episodes because you're listening yep. to them. So, so thank, thank you, you so much. Listening. Yep. yep. Mm-hmm. And that goes for all of you. Thank you for all of your listens. Yeah, not all of you have to just buy us beer. We're not saying that. Uh, it'd be great if you did. But if you did, we'd That'd be, be awesome. very thrilled. <laughs> yep. Uh, so thank you. Uh, if you want to find more of us, if you want to give us the feedback that we're asking for, if you want to provide us with your thoughts, concerns, questions, ideas, and feedback, please reach out to us. Uh, the most easiest way to do so is through our Discord channel where we are live chatting with everyone. And everyone. Uh, everyone who joins, we are involved in conversations with. Mm-hmm. Uh, that link is going to be in all of our social media posts that go along with our episode uh, announcements. You can also find us at 80bitpodsmash.com. That's our landing website where we have all of the podcast platforms you might care about, such as Google Play, iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, etc. If there is a platform that we don't exist on that you want us to be on, let us know and we will put ourselves there. You can find us on social media platforms such as Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and Reddit at 80bit pod smash the 80bit pod smash that is 80bit pod smash all lowercase no funny business no uppercases or, or punctuation yes excellent and next week will be our christmas episode it is so it'll and we're be doing the our Monday, gift exchange as he hinted to do earlier much we're going to be doing a much anticipated gift exchange where termite will not be getting the outer worlds <laughs> <laughs> apparently so <laughs> And you uh, will not be getting an original Xbox console. No, sorry. We're gonna be. We are gonna be having a main topic though as well. And in the in the vein of Christmas, I almost think this may be one of our most profound episodes yet. Ooh. We're talking about the ideas of exchanging gifts and different strategies that one might employ when exchanging gifts. Yeah, that is obviously applicable to, applicable to video games because. You might get video games as a gift. How about that? We're also going to be talking about generosity in general. Yeah. So that'll be that'll be a topic of our conversation as well, where we talk about just like what does it mean to be generous and why is generosity a great thing, a yeah. good thing for this world. So yep, that's going to be our episode. And yes, we will be exchanging gifts as our DLC. So yep. hopefully you'll look forward to that. I know I am. I am too. Yes, I'm so excited yeah, to get wait. some games. Yeah. But yep. So we'll see you next week. See you next week. <laughs> <laughs>